Here we go. Uh, I heard of this long since we're starting late. Do we have announcements? Rob, tell us about the workshop. All right, hack workshop. We've got everything is arranged now. We have hardware hacking, we've got programming, we've got Linux newcomers. All levels welcome, all projects welcome, all languages welcome. Feel free to join us. We always meet every other Tuesday at 66 Leroy Street downtown at the Hudson Park branch of the New York Public Library. Come in, go to the basement. We've got ourselves the big room downstairs. There's Wi-Fi, bring your notebooks, bring your laptops, bring whatever you want to bring. It's fun for all and all for fun. And we usually afterwards we'll go out for dinner. If you're well, if you wish to join the coordinators for dinner and some talk, feel free to. And um, this time, um, I think this um, upcoming Tuesday we've got um, for a program we've got people looking at LaTeX and Python. Um, we're doing um, Ubuntu for beginners and hardware hacking is still um, anything goes. So feel free to bring a subject. And back to Ron. Tonight we're going to get our Unigroup announcement from Unigroup. Thank you. Uh, you can, I'll be here later. You can grab me if you want. I run Unigroup, Unix Users Group. Uh, we meet at the Cooper Union School of Engineering, 7th Avenue, uh, 7th Street and 3rd Avenue downtown. The next meeting, deploying IP version 6, Perry Metzke is speaking. The meeting after that is NFS and NFS caching. Uh, we're a paid professional group. We have food at all of our meetings, $50 a year if you want to join. And uh, if you want on our mailing list, drop, give me a card or print your email address where I can read it and just hand it, hand it over to me. I'll be here. Uh, next. Uh, just like to say that our sponsor just spent something like $13 and bought one single burrito. The Unigroup fee pays for the food that is served at the meetings, and I think at this rate, it's a bargain. Yeah, you have, you have a good $15 worth of food at every meeting. Uh, any Thanks. other announcements? Yeah, please. Hi, uh, I'm Doug Hughes. I'm the Lisa conference co-chair this year with Tom Lincelli. He spoke here a couple, like last month or the month before. Um, the conference is coming up. The the uh, deadline for submissions is June 9th, so everybody's got a month and a half to come up with a really cool idea to submit for either a refereed paper or an experience report, or if you have invited talk suggestions, all of these get you basically free admission to the conference. And it's good value, it's close, it's in Boston, so you can just take the train up and it's in December. So I have some flyers, I'll leave them up here on the desk, and if you want one, grab one or you can go to the Usenix website. Anyone else? Any community events that uh, you know about that you'd like to tell everyone else about? Going once, going twice? Um, Mark Burgess is going to be uh, talking uh, May 25th. Meetup.com headquarters. Could you speak up a little so we can get that on the. Uh, Mark Burgess is going to be speaking May 25th at uh, meetup.com headquarters. If you go to uh, meetup.com slash NYC DevOps, you can see where that is. Oh, the DevOps. Is it DevOps? Okay. So, I'm glad you guys Okay. Could you maybe send us a, a little uh, something on the mailing list that we can distribute on that? Thank you. Anyone else? Nothing? I'd love well, to know how many people care about DevOps, actually. Um, anybody involved in that group here? A lot. <laughs> any, everyone, a lot of people looking at DevOps? That's the theme of the Lisa conference this year, so. Yeah, by all means. Anyone else? Then without further ado, I'm going to turn this over to tonight's pre uh, presenters. I'm sorry, I didn't get your names. Eric, Eric and John. Eric and John, please give them a warm welcome. So, I'm Eric Kasper, this is John Gulo, we're over at Etsy, and uh, hopefully you do care somewhat about DevOps. We're talking about deploying code to our website, and how we go about doing it, and how we sped that up, and how we move very fast and get things done without blowing up the world every day. Uh, I've been there for about two years, um, Kastner on Gmail, you can, you can email me any questions afterwards if you don't have time, at Kastner on Twitter, and uh, yeah. Um, I've been there for about a year, and we both basically work on the, what we call dev tools. And it's kind of uh, if you think of DevOps as a position, which it's really not. It's more of a cultural movement. That's what we do. So we kind of have our hand in both ops and dev, and tie the two things uh, together. So 
So I've given portions of this talk before. I'm going to do it a little bit differently this time. First of all, it's the first time I've done it with someone else. It's a little bigger in scope than I've done before. And it's also uh, it's going to go a lot deeper into details because you guys can handle that, whereas most audiences wouldn't be able to. So the first question is, uh, what is what, what do you mean by fast, and, and why should you care? Um, if you're doing anything on the web, what we mean by fast is getting code out there often, doing it in, in a safe way while still not slowing things down with undue process. Uh, and and for me, it comes down to something like this. I'm sure a lot of you have, have had a website where you just connect to the box, edit the file, and it's live. Uh, for me, this is fun. I mean, it, you know, it sucks in some ways because you don't have version control, and you, when you mess up, you really mess up, but uh, there's nothing quite like being able to just edit it and see it live right away. Um, but you can't, you can't do that when you get to a certain size. And then this happens. You get you get popular. You start ramping up on your developers. You start ramping up on users. You start making some money. Um, you start freaking out a little bit. <laughs> and this is kind of where the process starts getting introduced into the equation, where things maybe start getting a little less fun. Things maybe start slowing down a little bit. So uh, when you're developing anything or creating anything, you're always optimizing for, for one or several things. Uh, even if you don't realize you are. There's, there's some aspect that you're optimizing for. Uh, there's a lot of different things you can optimize for. You, you know, you want execution time to be fast. Um, you have, you know, you want the code to look nice for new developers. You want to increase the value of the company somehow. Hopefully, anybody working for a for-profit company, that's one of the things you're optimizing for. Some people optimize for always being able to test every line of code and make sure that it's, that it's valid. Uh, and the, the flip side of it is, whenever you're optimizing for something, you're always de-optimizing something else. And there's a trade-off. If you don't realize what that trade-off is, you can get into trouble. So you should know what you're optimizing for, um, and hopefully it's what you, what you want to be doing with your time and effort. Um, so one of the things you can optimize for is predictability, and that's that kind of stems from what I was just saying about you know ramping up on dev developers, money. Um, and, it's, and it's kind of a reaction to that. Um, and again, it's uh, basically putting a process into place. And, and why do these things come up is the question. Like, a lot of times you maybe started a new company and there's all these like weird things that are, that are you know, all these weird processes. And uh, a, lot of the, a lot of times the answer is, well, I don't know. Um, you know, maybe the site went down, the CEO freaked out, and then we decided we wanted to have a 20-person manual test team. Um, that's just an example of introducing a process, uh, you know, based on a reaction to something. So there's a, here's a few examples of, of things that can happen when you're optimizing for predictability or perceived safety. Um, you can have, you know, releases. Uh, put that in quotes because, you know, mostly we're talking about web software, and you know, it's stuff. It's it's usually a uh, scripting language running on a bunch of web servers. Not, it's not rocket science, you know. Releases are for shrink wrap software for something that's going to go out, you know, like XP. It's really expensive to, to push a patch out to that. It doesn't always work out so well. Uh, so that's why releases in, in the web world are usually a reaction to wanting to have predictability. You want to make it so that it's easier to, to bundle these up. And another example is, is introducing a release cycle like this. How many people have like a, a very thought, well thought out, like kind of slow release cycle? Anybody? Yeah. Um, it gets complicated. It gets to be a little bit less fun. It slows you down. Um, you're not writing as much code as you are focusing on the process. Um, formal queue is another great example. Uh, and I, I kind of, you know, what I was talking about earlier, where maybe the CEO was freaking out. You didn't introduce this, this process. Um, a lot. This is common. A lot of this is very normal to have this kind of formal QA. But um, what we do at Etsy is really just spread that QA out over time. So we do the QA in little little chunks, uh, constantly, rather than you know waiting two three weeks and then taking hours and hours to, to formally look over it. And another one is the sign off, where you know you have to get approval from fourteen different managers before you can cut a release and get it to the website. And then if there's a problem, you roll it back, and you have to get those same fourteen people to sign off on it again. And it's, it's a pain in the butt. It's uh, it it just continues to slow down your inertia and, and adds more and more process. And that's what we're talking about avoiding here. You know, keeping it fun and light. Uh, another one of those is a release engineer. Uh, if anybody here has ever been a release engineer. 
sorry. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I, I've done it as part of our, our old system, and it's uh, it's really unpleasant, and you know it's very very stressful. All all of the uh, hopes and dreams of all the developers are on your shoulders, and all the ire of ops is on yours as well. It's uh, it's not necessarily a fun position, so uh, it's another embedded reaction to something that's gone wrong in the past. Um, and what we're really talking about here is just ways to manage risk. And the thing about it is, as much as you try to manage this risk, something's eventually going to happen. You really can't, you can't check everything. It's, it's just kind of impossible, especially if you're doing manual stuff. I mean, the other thing is it gives you like a false sense of security around everything that you have. I mean, when, when you put all these processes in place and you think everything's going to be okay and it's not, um, that's where the problem is. And let's face it, we're not doing heart surgery here. We're, working on computers, working on websites, we're not, nobody's life is at risk. So there's a, uh, there's a quote by business analyst, Peter Drucker, I don't know, I don't know. Uh, and he, he compared and contrasted people and companies that take big risks and don't, and how they, how they kind of fare in the world. And generally, companies that, that don't take the risk make about two big mistakes a year. How many, how many big mistakes do you think people who take risks do? Two. Two. So, you know, if, if if that is true, I mean, it's hard it's hard to prove that. I don't know how he tested that, but if it is true, <laughs> if it is true, you know, why why wouldn't you take the risks? You know, why wouldn't you try and move move forward even more quickly? Um, a lot of what we're talking about, the, the processes that get in place, are really they really are perceived safety, perceived. Uh, stability and, and you're still going to make the mistakes and if you if you optimize your process and your system such that you can do things more quickly and you can take risks more often we tend to think that that's going to end up making a, a better system or product overall and uh, this is where it's just not fun anymore I mean you're not you're no longer really having a good time you're just going through this process and like it's just no good and to me like sad, sad engineers are going to be bad engineers got to be happy to be productive and you know it doesn't have to work like this like we saw before you know when you're one person you can edit a file directly there are other there are other ways that can scale up to as many engineers as you have um, as long as you are paying attention to the process and you're not letting it get overrun by <coughs> managers or by people who think that they have a stake in something and they, they want to be alerted at everything you do uh, you can have fun still, and you can you can make your system even better. Um, but the question becomes, what are you optimizing for? You know, are you optimizing for that stability? Are you optimizing for you know site speed? Are you optimizing for developer happiness? Um, and as a thought exercise, what would it be like if you were to optimize for developer happiness or speed of releases or releases per day or whatever else? How would your system change? What would need to change? Um, so that was basically, that was that, and this is sort of how, this is going to be sort of the story of how we got from processes like that to where we are today. So this is one of our wiki pages. So we used to have a release every two weeks. We have a wiki page for every release. On that wiki page would be every change that going out, who was the push manager for that release, what could possibly go wrong, what to do for each of those things that went wrong. Uh, how to test it manually before it went out while it was on our QA system, how to give the go, no go, and all the people who signed off on it. And this was a very short one. This was a, an in-between release that was actually really tiny. Uh, and we had a bunch of technical stuff, and, ju and just for context, this is, this is back in about mid-2009 when I started. Uh, and when I started, the team had already shifted, but the processes hadn't yet. So we've been, we've been moving towards this stuff since then. We had a bunch of technical stuff in place to enable this sort of workflow. We did all development in branches. Uh, and that, that caused some problems in that when a release finally did go out, if there was a problem, you'd have to make a hot fix and you'd apply it, which is fine. But the developers have already moved forward on the next iteration, so you have to backport it and maybe have a merge conflict there. Uh, at one point, we were taking all our code and bundling it up into RPMs are syncing those to all the servers, installing them as RPMs, and then cutting over the, the sim link to the, uh, the Active Directory. And this 
this was fun. So this was because of the web server we used. We used LightTPD. I don't want to talk about it. We use Apache now, thankfully. Um, Lighty has a nice feature where it doesn't do graceful. It just doesn't exist. So we would have to depool, turn off, bring up, repool. And that gets real, real fast. Um, and it was all controlled by a bunch of shell scripts that were written by the old ops team that uh, were completely inconsistent. They had different options. They had uh, they were on different servers. You had to memorize a whole long list of things or look at your bash history every time. And uh, it was kind of hard. No mortal could do it, you know, every time the same way. And us being developers and it being Etsy, uh, we had to find some way to make it fun. So we would pick a push song each time. <laughs> And that's a real good sign that your process is broken. If the most fun you have is picking the song to go with this scary push, maybe something's, uh, maybe something's up. So what ended up happening at Etsy is that all these walls became basically erected between the teams. You have a wall between dev and ops. You have you know, a wall, maybe you have a DP team. Um, the communication wasn't really there. And what happened was nobody really had like ownership over the code. So dev would throw the code over the wall. Um, ops would say, the code's inefficient, throw it back. Dev would be like, what do we do? It, and, and there was no communication or, or teamwork to figure out what was actually going on. And this just this <laughs> just not what we wanted to do. So um, Cal Henderson at Flickr wrote a book in 2006. Um, it's, a, it's a little outdated in some ways. Some things were a little bit made up when it came out. But by and large, it's still a very, very good book about how to run a site at scale. It's, uh, it's not language specific, it's just best practices. The two main things that you would get out of it are be dumb and the one button, one button push to flow, which is what we're gonna talk about. And that's the thing that really grabbed me about the book was this idea of having a web page with a button on it that you clicked and your code was live. Um, so this is what we implemented at Etsy. We started working on this. Uh, and even though you know I like the concept from the beginning, it just seemed kind of neat, it's taken me about two years to fully understand the implications of it and all the stuff that comes around it. I mean, it's just, it's just a hokey button on a web page that you can code up in an hour. But what it does is it's a layer of abstraction that decouples the mechanics of how it works from making it happen. As long as you're logging everything and you're doing some other things we're talking about in, in terms of when something does go wrong, how do you fix it and not just ignore it, it ends up, it ends up drastically changing a lot of things. So now, if it's your first day at Etsy, you're on the engineering team, the first day you deploy code. We basically try to remove that fear of breaking the site immediately so that you feel comfortable with pushing changes constantly. So we're going to do a little back and forth now of how it was then and how it is now. Like I said, there was a single deploy master. Um, it wasn't a set job. We didn't have a release engineer, although at that point we were starting to shop around for one. Uh, it was a specific engineer's job once Ops opened up those scripts to us. Uh, you would get nominated or you'd choose to do it and you would shepherd this release and it was all on you and it was very, very stressful. Um, today, anybody can deploy. Anybody in the company, not, not just engineering, we have people on support that deploy code, we have people that are project managers that deploy code. Uh, our, we, we had Fred Wilson, he's our, you know, one of the board guys, one of the investors, uh, deploy code. Um, we have enough trust in our tools now that we are very comfortable with having anybody do it. So, like I was saying before, uh, well, ops would ro roll back the code, but when it was engineer's time, you know, we'd push out this RPM or this bundle or whatever, and we'd, and we'd watch these logs. We'd, we'd tell our logs a lot because we didn't have a whole lot of graphs. And we'd watch it and we'd say, that looks a little bit weird. I don't know if that's expected. All right, let's roll it back. And then you look at this 10,000 line diff and you kind of guess where it might be and you make that change and you roll it out again and you wait, you wait, and you roll it back because you're scared. This goes on and on and on until finally you're comfortable with the code. And even then, you know, that log line, we can ignore that one because we don't really know what that means. Um, now what we do, we call rolling forward. Uh, we basically do not roll back and there's a couple reasons for that. For one, like we don't have a time machine. If anybody has one, let me know. But the reason is because mainly because we can you can really screw up data by introducing code changes and then try to roll those changes back. It's just not a good thing to do. So uh, what we do is if we have a problem, we, we basically, because of the way things are implemented, we can patch it easily, roll it out, roll forward. And we'll talk about that a little bit. August 27, 2009. <laughs> Never forget the day. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> Worst day ever. So I was the push manager. I think it was iteration 10. Um, it was a 12-hour deploy. It took 12 hours to get this code out to the website and be comfortable where, where we left it. Uh, we started at noon, which means we ended at midnight. And I live in New Jersey, so that sucked. Uh, my friend in the back there was the only one sitting with me the entire time and helped get it out completely. And it's very, very unpleasant. And the reason it was so unpleasant was because it was a major, major change. This, this, this branch of code had been worked on for a few months. It was a pretty big feature. And all along, it hadn't been tested against any real traffic, against any real data. So when we pushed it out finally, it was a holy crap moment. You know, not to mention that our web servers were on a different OS than our development environment. And things, things were not. <laughs> so it, uh, we, we want to avoid that kind of suck. Uh, now we deploy all day long, literally. Uh, probably 25, between 25 and 50 times a day. Usually averages about 25, 30. Uh, during the holiday season when we had a deploy freeze, we were deploying somewhere between 8 and 20 times. That was when we weren't actually allowed to deploy, but we just loved pushing through it. So, so now we're going to talk about how we made these changes. Yes? I just have a question just so I know the scope of what you're talking about. Are you talking about when you talk about code, or are you talking about binary being used as well, and the lib syncs, like some piece of code relies on the database? And we will get to that for sure. So at this point, you're not talking about that? You're just talking about web programming files that are not binary? And not well, so, so in 2009, a deploy was everything. Um, we would actually have uh, scheduled outages for two hours every week. To do what you guys have been talking about so far includes binaries or not? The, the current stuff is mostly script changes. Um, some of it is Java stuff going out. Um, but we'll talk specifically about database stuff shortly. Um, so how do we do it? We're going to tell you how we did it. Um, this is not prescriptive. This is not you know us saying, if you have a website, this is how you should do it. But maybe there are some things in here that will help you. And uh, like I said, we're always available to talk about this stuff. Somehow I ended up becoming really uh, interested in this stuff. And as nerdy as it is, I love talking about this stuff all day. So if you have specific questions, please, please ask. Uh, and we're going to talk about the things that got us here. And first and foremost, everything we talk about always comes back to communication. Like I said, when, right before I started, not, not when I started, but right before, there were very strong walls uh, um, amongst all the organizational units. Ops hated the devs, and the devs were split among the Python and the PHP people who hated each other. <laughs> and then there was the DBAs, who were the only ones allowed to actually touch business logic, except when the Python people did it on the side. Uh, so there was all these walls, right? And so they were mostly gone by the time I got there. But like I said, you know, things are slow to, slow to change. So a lot of the technical stuff, a lot of the processes were still there when I started. But communication has basically gotten us through all of it. Um, so now we basically are communicating to the point where it's actually a little bit annoying. Like when, when we push code, it goes into IRC, it goes into you know we get emails. Um, we're you know we're constantly talking about it. We have graphs that we can monitor. We have you know obviously a wiki that we can document things. In. Uh, but most important, we get off our ass and talk to people. Like well, I can talk to the guy next to me. I can talk to the guy on the ops team. Uh, nobody hates each other. There. We're actually kind of friendly, and that makes things. Um, another thing is there, everything's constantly evolving. Like we're always trying to make things better. Um, just like your website is constantly evolving, so do okay. so do our deploy tools. Yeah, uh, so are our deploy tools. So are the back end tools. And that actually means there are some pe some people within the company uh, dedicated to working on those things. And actually, everybody works on that stuff um, to some extent. Everybody wants to make it better. Everybody's trying to evolve the product. So here are some specific examples of, of things that were that we use to constantly iterate, in addition to the standard website metrics, which we will talk a little bit about in a, in a little bit. But we log all the deploy times. We log the output of all the commands that get run. We can see where things slow down, where things break. We can tell if one of the web hosts is slow to deploy to. We can pull it out of the pool. We constantly monitor the performance of our development environments. Every developer gets their own machine. Uh, they're all managed by Chef. So we take a look at everything. Where we know where they stand. They're all in ganglia. We treat dev like prod. Um, and I, I believe that's the only way to get it to where it's going to always be a pleasant environment. You now, you can set everything up the first time and have it be awesome, but entropy is going to set in and it's going to suck after a while. Whereas we are constantly, constantly trying to, uh, to fix it. 
And one of the one of the cool and annoying upsides of this is that developers have gotten so used to deploying so fast, they have to, if they have to wait more than 20 minutes, they start complaining. And they start getting really mad. So it's really cool. I know it's all about that. And uh, part, of, part of all of this is uh, openness and going back to the communication. One of the, one of the concrete examples of that is that every developer can get to any problem machine they want. Um, and we use just basic things that you guys all know about, you know, SSH. We, every developer can get to the machine. Uh, we hook it up with LDAP so that everybody has a, an identical account. Um, you know, VPNs, people can get the pride. Uh, so, actually, one question I had is who here has access to production machines? Sure. That's, that's actually pretty good. Who doesn't? No. Who does that scare the crap out of? A couple people. That's cool. Um, we another thing I wanted to mention here is the inverse is also true. Uh, ops can change code. You know, Chef is in our repo. They can make changes. They can make changes to the site if they need to. So it goes both ways. You know, it, DevOps whole concept is you know. Do, do you change developer code? Have you you me? Yes. I I'm, I'm the, the both, both of you. I'm the DevOps. So I have done yeah I've done both ops side and and dev side change both. both parts of the code. Um, so the, we basically default to open. We don't, uh, we don't have barriers, we don't have closed doors, except in very, very special cases, and that's very rare. So the idea is you know, somebody can come in and we give them a shell. That doesn't necessarily mean we give them root on their first day, but you, could, you should be able to have a shell. You should be able to run iOS stat, you know, stat, whatever. Um, there's no reason for us, the way we're doing things, not to default to open, uh, because that would just slow things down. And uh, we take you know, all, the, all the tools that we use, um, open source or, or otherwise, and we either remove the passwords from them, or we put them behind our single sign-on, or we uh, use LDAP plugins, whatever it is to make it so that you, know, you don't have different access levels across different people you know, artificially. You know, just because I'm in the uh, you know, front end group doesn't mean I shouldn't be able to look at the graphs from the API. Um, and we'll... We'll put that, uh, like for example, we, we've hacked Cacti, we took the password out, you know, no need for it. Ganglia, we don't use any of the auth stuff, we just put it, put it behind our, our VPN, so if you're on the VPN, you can see it. Our graph specifically, we have dashboards up on our walls. Any visitor to our office can see our actual numbers. Um, anybody who's on the VPN can get to the, can get to the graphs without signing into anything. So we try and be as open as possible. As for that single sign-on, quick nerd aside, uh, we're using Mod Pearl, so kind of cool. Um, it writes a cookie and then checks it for anything that's behind it. Very, very simple SSO. There's a lot of them out there. Um, but it's it's an example of doing the dumb thing, getting it done, and defaulting to open. And part of us being able to move the way we do is that we commit to Trump. This is fucking crazy, right? Like, who would do that? Why wouldn't you branch? Like, what, that doesn't make any sense. It would, there would be too many collisions, like, too, too crazy. Um, we actually branch in code rather than branch, make branches. Um, and the, 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 basically, the way that works for us is, um, well, I'll show you here. So this is, this is an example of the branching code. It's just an if, right? There's nothing fancy here. Uh, so taking a step back, most source control management systems were made by people who were building software that gets released, you know, big, big software, um, like the kernel. <laughs> it comes out of the kernel, but there's not a, there's not a kernel release every minute. You know, there's not 20 a day. There's, uh, there's, there's releases and branches make a lot more sense. For a website, you actually only have one user of your website, and that's the, that's the machines that's running them. And then you have a lot of people using that code, and we branch for them. So. Maybe one person sees something, somebody sees something else, A-B testing, things like that. And when we give this talk or, or we tell people about how we do things and we say branching and code, they, they tend to imagine something pretty complex and crazy. And when we show them this, they generally don't believe us. This is it. I mean, it, it's just ifs with a global variable. Uh, and what's cool about it is, you know, if, if we've decided to switch over to Thrift, it just starts working. If we have a problem, ops can flip a switch and turn it back to the old way. No one knows any different. Um, after a while, once we've decided that thrift is how we're going to go, things look good, the graphs have been stable, we've turned it up to 100%, we can remove that branch of code. Um, it makes our code uglier, for sure. 
but you know that's the trade-off that we're willing to make. We're not optimizing for you know the most beautiful code. We're optimizing for the ability to push fast, the ability to test things in production without taking down the site, doing everything like that. Um, but isn't the problem with ugly code is that it's harder to maintain? I mean, it's not just an aesthetic. You know, the yep. Doesn't work. Yep. So uh, that's a very interesting question. So. We do go back and clean up the code as time goes on, um, but what we end up finding is a lot of the time you end up replacing a lot of it you know, as time goes on, and that'll just be another if. So we don't have giant class hierarchies that you know delegate all the way down the stack and are fully reusable and you know all modular and everything like that because it actually doesn't help us. We've tried that and it ends up being um, a drag on productivity instead of the other way around. Um, that said, we do have coding standards. You know, we have reviews for everything, so we do try and keep things aesthetically nice as much as we possibly can. Another big part, yep. Just a quick question, how do you avoid like endless nested ifs then if you're continuously branching the code like this? You, have, you do have some of them, but generally there's uh, some pretty clear shearing points okay. of, you know, uh, we're, we're implementing a new search system, that's not gonna have that much surface area, right? You know, there's certain points where we're gonna change how that interacts. Um, and if we get to the point where you know there's something that's three levels deep and you know some of them are dead, you either fix it or you you, you know you go figure out what's, what's the deal. Another another very very big part of making this work and being able to, to deploy as often as we do is uh, the blameless postmortem. So anytime something goes wrong and things do go wrong, you know we're human, we're not fallible. Things will break, sometimes spectacularly so. And uh, what we do is. We get everyone who was involved in a room. We figure out what happened. Um, yeah, so are people pretty used to this concept? I mean, the idea is that something breaks, schedule a meeting with the people that were involved in the incident, uh, figure out what the root cause is, figure out how to remediate it, um, assign tickets to people with deadlines, and make sure that it never happens again. You only have this that issue once. Um, and question everything, like question Basically, anything. If, if your CEO shouldn't be there on Wednesday, you should question it. I mean, that's probably not really what brought your site down. But mm -hmm. the question is, you should question any part the, the idea is you should question any part of the process. Um, because, like I said before, you're constantly refining the process. So things shouldn't necessarily be set in stone how they are. So two, two more things about this. Um, so if, if the if as the postmortem it comes, we're deploying too fast, then we'll, we'll deploy less often. The other thing I wanted to mention was that um, what happens first with an outage is we actually communicate first. So we're big on communication. We post to Etsy status. We say something happened. We tweet about it. We let people know that we know there was a problem. So they're not just on the site wondering, this weird thing I'm seeing, is it for me? Is it for everybody? And that, that's part of the root cause. You know, I mean, part of the remediation is first communicate, then fix, and then figure out how to make sure it doesn't happen again. That's a great point. And we want to be the first to admit that our site has a problem so that the other people aren't telling us. Um, and part of the way we get here is just having, like we showed before, basically a very, very simple configuration for us since we're uh, mostly PHP. Uh, it's just a PHP file that basically anybody ops that whatever can edit, um, push immediately, it goes out in 10 seconds, the change is, is very easy. And it's actually let us do some really cool things with this kind of cheesy PHP file. I mean, it's just a giant array, but it lets us do things like slowly ramp up features to make sure they don't blow up when you know half the site uses it. So do you deploy your configuration independently of the main code base? Both. So it's part of the code base, and we also have a special config only deploy that ops can use at 3 a.m. when something's broken. Um, we do A/B testing through our configuration system. You know, we do all kinds of cool stuff, flipping things on and off, all the things we've talked about, and it's really, really, really simple. You know, going back to what, what we said before. You could make this really, really complicated if you want. You know, you could make it so that, you know, you had APC caching and that checked with the service every five seconds, and then, you know, updated the config live, and then if that service went down, your site would go down, like happened to Facebook. Or you can make it a simple PHP file that, you know, has no smarts in it. And a lot of what we're talking about now is trust. Um, we trust our engineers implicitly; otherwise, we wouldn't hire them. We you know, try and fire fast if somebody isn't worthy of that trust. We also have a few uh, knobs we can dial in terms of the internal tools. You know, We could take away somebody's uh, deploy rights. We've never had to, but that's possible. Um, but 
because we trust our tools and we know our code, the lines of change uh, are what we balance the trust with. So when we're pushing 20 plus times a day, each of those changes are naturally going to be very small. It's very easy for somebody to take a look at that and not have to understand everything else to know if it's going to break or not, to understand just that small change and have a good feeling about whether it's going to change or not, or be able to say, you know, this should really be behind the config flag, you know, and then we can turn it back on later. So we balance those, those two things. No. So how, what do we mean when we say small? Like it's small gazillion lines well actually it's like 20 30 lines like not that much code it could be more it could be less but the idea is that people are constantly iterating on features they have it that we dark launch uh, code so we put code out there that's not actually active um, and we do that via config flags and that keeps the commits um, extremely small and the commits keep coming because we aren't branching off trunk constantly uh, since everybody's committing to trunk with config flags we get constant uh, small commits that we can easily uh, analyze with problems uh, so what do we op actually optimize for? Um, I'd say a couple of things we optimize for is developer happiness. We want the engineers to actually like what they do. We want to have fun writing code. Um, and another thing is code agility. Like we want to be able to iterate quickly, uh, as quickly as possible. Right? Um, what we don't optimize for is the distant future. Again, I don't have a time machine. I don't know what's going to happen. Um, there's no need for me to try to build a lot of crazy things that maybe we're not even going to get to that level. Like, like, for example, Facebook put out hip hop. Um, I wouldn't deploy that on day one because I'm not at the scale that Facebook is, for example. Um, we want to optimize for the now, for today, and worry about tomorrow or later. Uh, we want to optimize for fast detection uh, and fast recovery. Um, we don't necessarily optimize for uptime because when you're moving this fast, sometimes you break things and you have to accept that and then figure out how not to break things. And if you're, if you're breaking things too quickly, then you slow down your deploys and you add a little bit more process. Um, we also optimize for doing the dumb thing. You know, like I said, out of, out of uh, Cal's book, and a lot of other people have mentioned this, um, we try and do the dumbest thing that's going to work. Right? And that'll prove whether it's worth continuing or, or you know, worth even working on. Uh, we apply this up and down the stack as much as we can. You know, there's always, there's always uh, with every engineer, every single one of us, there's always a tendency to try and over-architect. It's just fun. It's easy to do. Um, we have a saying, though. We work hard to be this dumb. We have all these systems in place so that we can make these changes and, and make these you know, small hacks and do them constantly so that we can, we can get to the site to where we want it to be. Uh, and you know, some people, do, does anybody know what these uh, acronyms are? The first one, MT, MTBF. <laughs> Uh, so uh, there was a, I think Arthur Bergman compared this to, to owning a Jeep versus a Rolls Royce. A Rolls Royce is optimized for not breaking down, right? And when it does break down, it's going to be a long time before it does, but when it does, it's going to be really expensive and hard to fix. You're not going to be able to do it yourself. A Jeep is made to be tinkered with. You're going to break it, and they give you the tools to fix it when you do. Our site is the same kind of way. You know, we're moving fast. We want to very much optimize for being able to find the problem quickly and fix it quickly, and then figure out how not to make that mistake again. Uh, with, a, with, a, with a formal QA and long releases and lots of testing, you're optimizing for not failing. And then when you do fail, you're kind of, kind of stuck. You're in a much worse place, and it's going to take you a lot longer to recover. Um, so here's a lot of the frequently asked questions that we get. I'm sure you guys are wondering some of the stuff, and we can talk about it now or after the talk, whatever. But um, I'll just go through them kind of quickly. Um, so schema changes, uh, do we continuously deploy schema changes? The answer is no. Um, databases are hard. We have you know, a very intricate sharded uh, architecture. It's just not quite as easy, especially at our scale, to deploy uh, database changes. But I'm working on it. Uh, <laughs> testing in CI, like we do have that. Um, we run tests uh, before we go to production every time but it doesn't block us from pushing to production. So in the event that we really feel confident about something or for some reason need to push a change through quickly, uh, we don't have our, our test system blocking our deployment system. Uh, QA, we, we kind of, yeah, we kind of answered this, but, but basically developers do their QA. Um, the person that developed the code really knows what to test best. Um, and there's no way you can touch every single possible corner of the site anyway, in our opinion. So 
we don't really have a formal QA. We just put that kind of kind of on the developers. Uh, but, but, but that yeah. that begs the question. So so sure, the developer knows knows the best uh, tests and all that. But in, for on the DevOps side, you were talking about openness. Mm -hmm. So do they give you their tests and do their te you know you know can they contribute their tests as part yes. of? Yes. Uh, yeah. So so we have we have a whole a whole bunch of testing systems. We have unit tests which are in the code base. We have um, what we call platform tests, which are kind of integration-like tests, which are in the code base. And we have functional tests, which will do a full stack test using Selenium, go through press buttons, things like that. So when a developer writes their tests, they are in the code base. If they have a manual test that they're going to do, a lot of times they will write those steps down in the wiki. It goes uh, part into, partly into what we're going to talk about next, which is um, saying, is this thing ready to go or ready to be turned on in most cases? And in those situations, we'll say, when we turn it on, we should see X, Y, and Z, and if we don't, it's going to be a problem. And that's usually codified into the wiki. Yes. What do you do to store all your automated tests, sort of build those tests and have them sort of the constantly used for unit testing, and then you know, integration testing? So we have we have uh, Jenkins, and we use for our CI, and it's our test runner, and we use PHP unit for just about everything. We also use Cucumber for the functional tests themselves, Cucumber with Selenium. Um, so it's all, it's all, it's as close to the, production code as it can be. You know, we don't we don't ever want things off on their own. You know, you'll, you, it, there's a theme that you may have seen that we try and remove these barriers and try and remove these artificial separations. And that includes the test code. And uh, you know, if we had if we had a separate testing group that controlled all the tests, you know, it'd be more barriers instead of less. So that's the kind of stuff that we're trying to. Uh, yeah, and it's also made, like if you miss something, which I mean nobody's perfect. It's amazing how fast the community gives us feedback. We can quickly iterate it and efficient fix. Um, and also, you know, commit a regression test to make sure it doesn't happen again. Um, does this mean we can't do big projects? Um, no, we do big projects all the time. We just make sure we have config flags around it. Um, we do have projects that last uh, weeks and months. Um, we just dark launch that code. That code's in trunk. Uh, operability reviews. So this is kind of an interesting thing because it sounds like it's very formal and very like walled off, but really this is just another form of communication. It's like, uh, the ops and dev teams are so close that operability reviews aren't as formal as it sounds. It's just a way for us to say, hey, I'm about to like ramp up to 25% on this feature. Just want you to know, let me know if you see something that I don't see. Um, it's not so much as like a big form meeting that we have planned out with 20 people and a big uh, spreadsheet of stuff that we have to check off. Question. Um, you were talking about dark launching the big projects, um, so, and that, that those were releases as well. Um, what fraction of your sort of 20 to 30 releases a day um, are user visible, and what fraction? Well, of I'll answer it this way. Most code that goes out has a config flag around it of one kind or another. Um, it depends on what, what they're doing and you know how it's working. All new features are fully wired off by default. We turn them on, we turn them up, um, and that's how we ramp up slowly by, you know, saying we have a new listing page. We're going to release it to one percent right now. We're going to see what the graphs do. Um, most of the code, you know, and, and code that doesn't have the flags around it, as it's getting refactored, will have flags around. We had a big push for the holiday season when we went through <clears throat> every major feature of the site. We put a flag around so we could, if there was an emergency, turn off just that specific. So we tend to we tend to try and treat things that way as much as possible. Uh, so, yes. Nope. So everything is on every server. Um, so how do we release the features to the users? And we believe that release is a marketing term. Right. So when we're going to release a feature, that means it's it's configed up to 100%. Everyone's getting it, and we're going to start telling people. Right? There's, a, there's a decoupling between the code going out and, and us announcing it. Right? Because if you say, we're going to release our new cart on the 27th, and we deploy it that day and there's a problem, we're in trouble. But if we've been running that code in parallel and throwing away the results for 1%, then 5%, then 10%, then 100%, and we know that it's going to work, we flip that switch to 100%, we turn it on for everybody, and we say, hey, we released a new cart, check it out. So the code's always there on all servers. We don't do any affinity of any kind. All code goes to all servers all times. Yeah. Uh, 
a lot of times that we do ramp up just to the people that work at Etsy first, so we can kind of test things uh, ourselves. Um, and we do bucket users, so if you get a, a new feature, we want to make sure that you keep getting that feature and that it doesn't keep flipping. Um, and it's also, uh, we also have a new system called Experiments, where any developer can turn something on for 1% of the users and you know come up with something cool and, and get it out there. Where are you setting this percentage of what, actual, what actually happens in that percentage? In the config system. It's in the big file. Right? So it's, it's all just PHP. We say percent equals one. And then when, the, when Apache restarts, when somebody gets that code, if for whatever reason they're in that bucket, they'll get that branch of code. Otherwise, they'll get the other one. Very, very, very simple. If, if you could think of a simple way to do it, we're doing it that way. How does one percent? I mean, how does how does one percent of Apache servers work? They don't. So so it's all based on the code path. So uh, I log into the site. My user ID, for example, you know, you can hash on user ID. There's a bunch of things you can do. My user ID is fifty, and that hashes me to the first bucket. So I fall into that bucket. I get that code path. So the code's everywhere, and it's based on. It could be based on a user. It could be based on shop, it could be based on you know your name being in a list of like you. It could be you're an admin, so you get to see the feature for everybody else. You could be in an experiment. And what's doing the bucket hashing? Uh, the A B system. So we have we have some A we have a, a A B class that uses the configuration system to determine how to run these experiments and also does the analysis for all that kind of stuff of how well is A tracking versus B. We have buckets pretty grasp for that kind of stuff. Yes. Um, it seems to me that we're gonna Problems that you run into would be common tendencies. So, 15 things use one particular set of classes or whatever. I need to change one of these 15 things, requiring a change to the thing that yep. 14 other things do. Um, what's, the dumbest way you, to, what's the dumbest way you could think to, to get around that? Uh, clone, apply. <laughs> You're kidding. No. No. No, you, you can make, make cart2.php. Not even inherit the class. I mean, you can. I mean, I mean you can do it. You know, there's a bunch of different ways to do it, um, but generally we do we do the stupid way. You know, uh, not that long ago we changed some major CSS changes, um, and we wanted to roll those out. It's actually kind of a hairy problem rolling out CSS changes. We just had a second file, and then at the top of the header, if you're in this bucket, you get this one. Otherwise, you get this one. And you know that goes all all throughout the stack. Well, the real question was, how was it changed your class design and your architecture? That's a tough question because the, the class design and architecture has changed independently of all that uh, as well. You know, we've, we've tried to simplify as much as possible and remove uh, any long dependency chains that we have. You know, we try and keep the code as flat as possible. Um, there are still a lot of places where we have pretty deep hierarchies, and those places are much harder to iterate on because, you know, we have the dependencies up the like layer and the Exactly. Those are the ones I'm thinking of. Uh, so what we're talking about is the deploy nader mindset, right? I named deploy nader so I can have a uh, cool name. So I can say it's the mindset, um, and the, the mindset is all about communication and iterating, and you know having visibility to everyone about all of these things. So I'll bring this up in a question. Um, have you wondered if the people that end up being that first bucket, so are always the first people to see things from a different percentage of the sites and the people that are in the last bucket. Right? We have different hashing algorithms. Um, oh. So our, our the A/B test is dependent on what how you want to hash it. You know, the person releasing the feature is the one who's going to decide, or the pro project manager is going to say, you know, I want this to only show up to sellers who have over ten items. You know, and we'll come up with a different hashing algorithm for that, and that's how they get to their buckets. Okay, so there are a bunch of different sets of buckets. There, there is. There's, there's a whole bunch of there's a whole bunch of tests going on at any one time, and how the how the person gets into the test. Sometimes it's just random, you know, and then we set you a cookie so that you you're always in that bucket. Um, it really depends on on the test itself and what what we're trying to prove. When we're doing. AB is a whole interesting concept together that is is probably its own talk. And I definitely don't know enough about it, but it's cool. So this is the planeator itself. It's very pretty. Uh, just as a quick note, that QA right there is a misnomer. It's just a historical artifact. Uh, our first step along our push tr push path is QA, but it's just, it's just basically an integration point. So if I have some changes going in and John has some changes going in, this may be the first time that they're running on, on a machine together, so it's our first integration point. You can see if there's any problems there. 
and you go on to Princess, and then you go on to Production. Princess is like a staging environment that points to the production database. That's why she's in the, uh, the castle. <laughs> so, uh, so we, uh, an interesting story is why we called it Princess, and, and the reason is because we had a staging environment before in the old world, and it meant something very, very, very different. So we needed a name that was a complete break. And uh, Etsy has a really cool feature where you can do whoever's name.etsy.com. So we first did Unicorn, and that was taken. Our princess wasn't. So it was princess. Um, now what you see on this page is the buttons are just buttons. They're not that interesting. What's much more interesting is the logs, right? You can see who did what when. You can see the versions on all the different uh, stages that you're going to be pushing through. You can see a link that says what version is about to go out and all that changes. And I don't, these are kind of boring. Uh, when you push the button, here's a quick, quick nerd side note. Uh, yeah. So Deployinator is, is written in Sinatra, and it will be open source this summer. Uh, one of the cool things about it is when you push the button, it streams the output of everything that's happening, and that's what this cool uh, stream middleware. Uh, but much more interesting is this. Oh, uh, oh, sorry, and with this, like I said before, it's, it saves uh, all the logs, right? So somebody says, my push seems a little weird. We can go look at the log and see exactly what happened. Uh, but normally they'll tell us why it's weird, because they saw the output and they caught it. This is the prod button itself. We zoomed in here. I want to talk about everything you see here, just so you kind of know, you know what we're talking about. There's the button. That button makes magic happen, makes the bits go everywhere. Above the button is the current version that's live and the version that's about to go live. And if you click that link, you'll get a diff of everything that will go out with this push. You'll see a, a, a complete diff of all the changes that are about to happen. So nothing is about to go out? The numbers are the same. Yep, nothing's about to go up. Okay. So, so at this at this point, you're, they're probably on Princess. So what happens is, uh, not to get too far into it, if we have time later, we have slides where we can really go into it, but code gets updated on QA, it gets pulled from this VM, and then that code gets moved over to Princess, and then that code gets moved over to production. So we're not pulling from head on production. So when that version didn't change, it means we're not ready to push production. Uh, but, and, and also, Underneath are very important links, and those are things that you watch after you push to make sure that things went well. So a lot of people that are talking about continuous deployment have fully automated systems. We've specifically gone the opposite direction. We want a human pushing the button, and we want a human watching the, the logs and the graphs after them. Um, so this is a line I just ripped right directly out of IRC. Um, and it's just, again, to kind of illustrate the communication that we do. Um, you know, as you can see, you know exactly what time, uh, what we were pushing, when, uh, who pushed it, uh, to what environment we pushed it to. Kind of obvious stuff, but it's important. Um, as well as when you click on that link, it'll bring you to a page uh, in Deployment that shows us the divs. It's the same thing you'll see if you click the link above the button. Um, and again, like I said, we annoy people with the communication. This is just an email with like, the same stuff. Um, the idea is that anywhere you are, you can see what's happening. Uh, you don't have to be in IRC. You don't necessarily have to be checking your email. But since we use various forms of communication, um, you'll at least be alerted to what's going on. And same kind of idea. I, we had a hack week a couple weeks ago, and I was like, I kind of sometimes don't know what's happening when somebody else is pushing the button. So they know what's happening. They see the log screen streaming. Uh, but I wanted to see it. So one, one little project that I implemented was just uh, a way to see kind of what was happening when somebody else was pushing the button. So right here, what you see is the log um, streaming by as the code is getting deployed and some other very specific information. The, this green thing is our test suite, um, times, links to the diffs, same stuff, a uh, different way to see it. Um, so how do we know when something goes wrong? Well, we graph the hell out of everything. It's crazy. We have so many graphs, like, it's almost to a point where we don't know what to do with them. We do have a little bit of a solution for that. Um, we have various systems like Ganglia. I don't know if, does anybody know uh, Ganglia Graphite? Anybody use that stuff? Yeah, it's, uh, Ganglia is kind of similar to, to Cacti. Oh, of uh, yeah, and then we basically use these systems to aggregate data. Uh, we have a bunch of tools that we wrote. A couple of them are on GitHub. If you go to our GitHub page, Etsy's GitHub page, um, StatsD and Logster. Uh, StatsD is basically counting. Logster is basically a way to 
to look at basically the end of the log up to the point it was read last and parse that information and stick it somewhere useful. Uh, we use Splunk right now, uh, kind of hoping to move to Hadoop, but Splunk does work for us right now. It's a great way to, to just dig in and, and analyze uh, logs over time. Uh, what we call SuperGrub is just a streaming, a way to look at the logs in your browser. So instead of having to actually, even though people can SSH into the servers, sometimes a lot easier for me just to open up a, a browser window and look at the logs there. And that, that's just a, a node-based backend that streams logs. To the so uh, what, what we, what, why we have this on here and why we've open sourced these things is we're, we're very, very interested in graphing everything, but the key to that is making it easy for a developer to start graphing something something they care about. You know, they shouldn't have to talk to the ops and say, I want this new graph. So statsd is just a one line. So statsd, colon, colon, increment, key name, and value. And the value is off, you just increment by one. So anytime something happens that you want to be alert, you know, you want to count, you just say increment. And then it just shows up in graph by 10 seconds later. So it's these kinds of tools, and Logster is a similar thing. It's a way of rolling up uh, logs into an easy to see format and being able to turn them into graphs. Uh, a lot of this stuff is just to enable developers and ops and everybody else to create graphs so they can see things. And because it's so easy to create graphs, everybody kind of likes doing it. They, you just kind of do it as part of your feature development. Um, you, as you're develop, developing a feature, you kind of want to see what's going on when you launch it. So because it's so easy, it's just one line of code, people are throwing it in. Uh, now we have like 40,000 graphs. <laughs> so what do we do? So things can't take off unless they have it cool name, so this is our cool name for it, Dashboard Driven Development. We have all of these graphs, but there's only a few that you're going to care about. And what we do is we make it super easy to not only create graphs, but to create dashboards. So you say in code, I want a, I want a graphite graph of this stat, I want the ganglion of this, et cetera, et cetera, and then it shows up on our web page. So the idea is that we have dashboards for the things that we care about, business metrics, you know, when I'm going to be deploying a new feature and I care about that feature, I'm going to make a dashboard for myself that gets the relevant bits. But we're still graphing everything else in case there's something that we didn't see there. We can go look at the other graphs and we can correlate things. And in terms of correlation, it's a very big part of what we do. Uh, so these are a few of our, these, these are the graphs of our error logs. These are actually on our screens in our office and they're part of what to watch after a deploy. And these are just one of the dashboards that pops up. There's another one that, that are business metrics. You know, People who are people who have uh, signed in correctly, checked out forum posts. That's a very interesting one. We actually track how many uh, posts we get to our forum, and those graphs will actually spike before a lot of our error graphs because our users are faster than computers. It's kind of crazy. Also, it's worth pointing out these lines is these are our deploy lines. This is us deploying throughout the day, so we can cor correlate the deploys to changes. In yep. And we put those lines on Graphite and Ganglia, Cacti. They're everywhere. So when, when something looks weird, and you see a line right before it started looking weird, you have a good sense of what it was, you can go find that deploy, see what went out, push forward. Uh, just a very quick uh, discussion about why we built this. Um, we suffer from not invented here syndrome, so we had to build our own. Not really. Uh, we, had, we looked at a lot of things before we, we did this. Um, these were kind of the popular ones when, when we built this, you know, mid-2009, late-2009. There's a lot more now, there was other ones then. Uh, I'll admit, I actually love Capistrano, I use it in a lot of my projects, um, and we use Chef for all kinds of stuff we do. Uh, but in terms of what we wanted to accomplish, in terms of the visibility and the announcing and all that kind of stuff, we decided that building our own was the, was the most important part. But the flip side of that is, it doesn't actually matter. Deployinator is just a MacGuffin, it's just, it's just a button on a web page. What matters is the stuff on either side of it. So if you push that button and Capistrano ran, Okay, cool. You know, if, if you push that button and it, and it kicked off a chef run, that's fine too. As long as that button doesn't change, developers keep doing it the same way, and we can see what you know how these changes do everything. So the question is, does it work? Right? I mean, we've talked about some cool stuff, some maybe potentially crazy stuff. Um, we we think it works. Otherwise, we wouldn't keep investing in it. Uh, we had six change-related incidents in 2010. I don't know how we got that number, but that's what John Oswald says. So that's what it is. Uh, and in November, we had 721 distinct deploys. So it's working for us, for sure. Um, we tend to think that it can work for a lot of people who aren't doing things this way, which is why we come out and tell our story so that hopefully other people can, can be happier.
Uh, and the key to doing it is just start small, right? So just make a web page that has a button that runs a shell script. It doesn't matter what the shell script does. You know, log when the log who pushed the button, when they pushed it, and what happened when they pushed it. And you're most of the way there. And that's it. Questions. We have a 10-minute Q&A panel. Perfect. Uh, we can stay as long as Mike's able to stay. How long is that? Oh, yeah, 20 minutes is good. All right, 20 minutes Q&A panel. Excellent. As long as the room doesn't <laughs> set on fire. Yes. Uh, What's that? Yes, chef. Or for our config system. So our config system is managed in a big PHP file. And we also have a deployinator endpoint, deployinator slash config, which is that file in a text area. Change it, push it, it gets checked for a syntax, it's checked into SVN, gets deployed 10 seconds. Simple, simple, as dumb as it can be. With 30 different deployments happening a day, how does an individual anti developer keep track of what's important for them? Those are going to something else. That's a good question. So, um, like I said, or like he said, we email every deployment. That deployment has the full diff in it. We also email every SVN commit. Uh, that's a lot of emails. Yeah. A lot of people have filters set up for files they care about, or strings they care about, things like that. Some developers actually read everything. Kind of nuts. Um, but it's one of those areas that is going to be hard to scale. As we, as we scale up, that's going to become more and more of a problem. Some companies have solved that in different ways by siloing people off. It's not really their style, so they'll find another way to get around it. But we will. Yes? When five people are trying to deploy simultaneously, does it get serialized, or, or how does that happen? Is there a cue? Go ahead. Where was the slide before? <laughs> well, well, we actually have like 40 more slides, but. <laughs> <laughs> uh, all we're talking about. <laughs> um, really, all we do is, again, super simple. We just, we, what we call the push train. It's just setting the topic in the IRC channel that we call push. Uh, yeah. And looks like this. People separate their name with a pipe. Uh, yep. That way you know which order people are going in. We Dumb, were, right? It's so <laughs> stupid, but it works, it works. works really, really well. Um, we communicate that topic in a bunch of places, too. Shows up in Deployinator, whatever, a lot of places. And, and you can see here, no, you can't see, no one's, no one's bunching up. People, uh, people will bunch up, and you know, five people can deploy a bunch. You can get in one push. Um, yeah, single yeah. system. And you can yeah. see, actually, M. Horowitz is config. He's going to be doing config only push. He's going to use the config editor and help you in and out of the train really, really quick. So it just comes out of communication. Other questions? Other questions we have other slides about, yes. So, so what are some of the worst things that have happened uh, as you guys have moved to this new process? When you, when you think, say, think break all this? Everything melted. <laughs> no, actually, we, we, have, we have far fewer incidents than we did before. Far, far, far fewer. Um, the incidents before, in addition to having scheduled downtime for two hours, which just hurts, uh, whenever we push something out that wasn't fully vetted, the site would break in some way. Um, so now, with the culture of wiring things off, config flags, you know, other people looking at what you're pushing, we tend to have much fewer breakages. Our biggest breakage would be a full site outage, which we haven't had in a while. Yeah. So we plug right now. Yes? You mentioned the reviews. Yes. How does that factor into the push of the process? You want to talk about the reviews? So, really, code reviews we do on kind of a per team basis. Um, Part of it's very informal, like because we're sending out the diffs over email, the people that are interested are hopefully looking at those. But each team also has a process for code review, and we kind of let the team lead decide what they want to do. So some teams actually look at every single thing before it's committed. Um, they just have a rule that you know one or two people have to sign off. Single line change, um, single character yeah, change. Yeah, even so down to that small of a change. And other teams that are are very much more loose about it. Um, it's just kind of it's just very much. And our code review, our code review can either be, you know, uh, the gist, or it can be um, a crucible review. We have crucible. We have a lot of Atlassian tools, um, or it could be some third-party thing that that team specifically likes. Maybe they just want to patches around. 
like you said, it is, it is per team. We are looking at making that a little bit more uh, cohesive so that you know cross-team stuff is a little bit easier to, to review and we have one re review tool instead of all different ways. But so far, we've gotten away with this. You know, when it becomes a problem, well, we address it. So the team size, um, we have about 10 teams. Yes. And some teams are three people and some are 15. Um, but we try and keep them around the, the, what's it, the two pizza number, which is around eight people or so. Um, but we also have people who really aren't, aren't on team, like John and I, we're, although we're kind of becoming a team. Um, we, we can accommodate a lot of different things. And that whole process, which, which actually encapsulates the product design stuff and how we, how we make features, you know, not just the coding bits, all of that is in flux and it's a process that we're currently iterating on. And we're getting some more. Somewhere over there. Yes. Has it changed your hiring process and how do you know who's likely to fit in or who doesn't fit in, that kind of thing? Um, yeah, I mean, I think the answer is yes. Like, we do look for good, good cultural fits. Um, it doesn't mean you've had to do this before, it just means you have to be a little bit excited about what we're doing. Or um, scared. Okay, yeah. <laughs> scared is a good sign. <laughs> But, but in the end, you have to kind of embrace what we're doing, so we're not, we're not changing any time soon, at least, um, until that stops working for us. And, and it has changed our hiring in that uh, not only are we doing things this way, but we're, we're talking about it. You know, in situations like this, we blog constantly, we've talked at conferences, and it's helped recruiting. You know, people say, that looks like a really cool way to work. I want to work that way. I want to be able to push the button. I don't want to have to deal with, you know, someone else signing off my work. So it does help in that direction, too. So it's a bit, it's a bit of self-selection, so it definitely has changed. Um, how, how does, what does this work with your product managers? Do they like it? Do they make it so our, our product managers who are currently there love it and they push code too. All our product managers know JavaScript and CSS, especially CSS and HTML. They make changes to the live cycle. Um, and they love it. And you, you have product managers who are pushing code. Do you have, like, I guess, maybe marketing people who are kind of doing features with you guys but not kind of buying into this whole? Not really. Um, so, so generally the way we're structured is, you know, a team will generally, or, or a feature will have a product manager, and a team or a few people assigned to it, and any one of those people we push in the code for it at all times. Um, our CEO, I think, has only pushed code once, and he's kind of a product manager, so he's, a, uh, he's an ally. Yes? What you just said was the best recruitment you could have done. You don't have people meddling in things. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So on the note, are you guys hiring? <laughs> yes. Um, yes. Always hiring. Always Jobs hiring? Done at you guys have a um, city look, NYC location or no? It's Brooklyn. Brooklyn? Yeah. Oh, Dumbly. not bad. First stop off the air. Or off the air? Uh, ARF, um, first stop. I'm hopping there inside tonight. Excellent. Yeah. yeah. If I, in, yes. your, yep. in your push oh, train, yeah. can, can Rachel mock her stuff as only <laughs> stole it if I'm there watching it? Or so does it go automatically? No, no, no. She's pushing the button. Right. So when you when you hop in that queue, so so Rachel, Rachel if, if she has to leave and she's in the queue, she takes herself out. She takes herself out. Yep. It's probably worth noting also that she's not just pushing necessarily her changes. Um, she could be pushing a lot of dark changes, but because we know that they're flagged off, we can't think about pushing them. Um, but she's the since she's the one actually pushing the button, she's the one that does. Want to be there push. typically when it goes live. Even oh yeah. Off. Yeah. We also have we also have a uh, don't push and run. <laughs> don't push and go and leave right away. Yeah, stick around. <laughs> yeah. The Friday rule. Sort of. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, so when you guys started to make these operational rule changes, like in 2009, you said, all right, every junior DBA can log on to any system and have pseudo access. And then some of the operations guys were like, uh, I don't know about that. Did you have to have like one single strong leader to say, judge, jury, executioner, yes, do all this, or was it a lot of like medium leaders? It was a bit of both. So what happened was, um, a couple of different things happened. Our CEO changed right around that time. Um, our founder had left the CEO, and we brought in a real CEO. And she did a lot of good things for uh, getting us to profitability, but she did a lot of bad things for how we push code, you know, all that kind of stuff. She had a lot of that process. When Rob came back, we said, hey, look at this tool we built. And, you know, that was that was a big, a big uh, push forward for it. The other part of it is, 
when developers see you pushing code and it's just going live, and they're sitting there waiting for all the other steps to happen, they start to you know get upset and make noise, and it's a it's a big change from underneath. And then we also had uh, Chad, our CTO. We we have a lot of um, engineer love in our organization. We very much love engineers all the way up to the top. Very engineering culture. So the engineers are clamoring for continuous deployment. But the, the key piece missing there is that I said, you know, this started in mid-2009, here it is 2011. There was a lot of small steps along the way. There was never there was never a point when you were like, whoa, we're doing this now. It was always, you know, iterative. Do you know any companies doing this with static impact languages, libraries, the whole deal? So I'm thinking PHP is a big reason we can do these things quickly, right? Well, we push our search stack out, which is solar, Java. So not all PHP. What other companies do you know that adopt it? Um, Twitter is doing something similar. Uh, they they were at a more formal release schedule. Now they're doing much more iterative this way, and a large part of their uh, stack is Java and Scala. Um, beyond that, I don't know. I mean, for some reason, up until recently, a lot of this stuff just wasn't talked about. You know, how we deploy code. Either people were embarrassed, or they thought it was a competitive advantage. In neither, in neither case should be true. I mean, everyone should be embarrassed because it's always you know. It's always broken in some way, and it's not like a bit of an advantage because you're pushing code, you know? Uh, look online for IMU and um, Eric Reese. There's a lot of uh, Yep, a lot of this stuff, a lot of stuff is definitely uh, inspired by, by those posts, and uh, Tim Tim Fitz's post on continuous deployment that came out around some time. He, he worked it from here. Do you think using a distributed version control system could help your processes at all? It's a fantastic question. <laughs> Um, so the short answer is we're probably moving to Git despite the ability to branch better. Okay. <laughs> 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 yeah, so we want to keep things, we, we, we want to discourage people very strongly from going off on their own and building a giant tower because when they finally integrate it, there's going to be problems, you know? So um, personally, I'm going to work with short-lived local branches because that's a great way to work and I'll rebase. I'll be very happy with that. But as soon as I push up to whatever our canonical repository is, it's mainline and it's gone live. How do you do like you know, planning and you know, integration sprints? Do you still work that fashion? Uh, that's a very good question. Um, so like I said, that's currently a process that's undergoing some change. Okay. But we do generally have a six-month plan broken down into two-week cycles. Uh, each team is going to have some stuff that they're delivering in that time. We try and uh, plan features out that way. We've had some stickiness with that, so we're trying to move to a slightly more fluid system. But it doesn't approach anything like Agile or Scrum or anything like that. It's definitely uh, much more ad hoc. Um, you said with, uh, with branches, you don't want people going off and building a big tower, but with feature flags, aren't they just building a big tower inside a feature flag? They are, they are, but that code is already on the website. That code has been there since day one. That code can be turned on or turned up slowly so that we can see if it's going to have a problem at any point. Um, and also, people are going to be watching those commits. And as you, as you pull down each day and you commit each day, that baseline is moving with you. Instead of, I started here, and then two weeks later when I go to integrate it, everything's changed out from underneath me. So that's why we avoid this. Question here. We'll say yes. Questioner, speak up. So, you know, with all these feature flags, do we, and all these ifs, do we end up with a ton of ifs that are basically dead? And yeah, we certainly do. Um, we, we clean it up. Um, we don't have any kind of formalized cleanup process around it. Um, but basically, if you're creating a new feature and you see there's a flag already around the old way it was, you remove it. Um, or if you're, you know, bored, you go clean it up. You know, if you're if you're in a, in a state of mind where you can't think about this heavy problem anymore, you can go clean up some feature flags. Um, our code isn't messy enough now yet to where it's like 
crafted our clean it up, and we've been doing a good job of tracking, but it is nothing at all. How large is your code base? No idea. Yeah. No one knows. <laughs> I don't have a lot of It's a few million lines. And, yeah. and that's a round number. Do you guys uh, get by with one staging environment? Or, or is there ever like developer contention for who's testing what feature on, on that environment? <coughs> that's what the question is for. Okay. Uh, so our staging environment is a couple boxes. Load balance, they look just like production and talk to production databases. They're prop, basically. But whoever's, whoever's currently pushing has control of the princess. But like you said, you know, somebody else's changes could be in there. They could be dark, or they could have, they could have you know, jumped in with me, and we could be testing together. We also try to make it so that people can do their testing uh, before they get into to this point. So you, sh you should really have things well, pretty well tested uh, in development and feel confident about it enough to, to go to Trump with it and to get it out there. So you're not, that way you're not holding up everybody else. And it's easier to feel confident about a 10 line change than a thousand line change. Yeah. Is that five minutes left? And this gentleman here is trying to do yeah. Yes. Yeah, thanks. Um, so T team A introduces a change. Who or what's going to make sure no security vulnerabilities are introduced? And then team B and C are all pushing stuff out too. Now you have, now you, you know, you have a problem in some unrelated area of code or everybody thinks is unrelated. Yeah, how do you address that? Do you start rolling things back because you know you want to see what changed recently? So uh, with all the graphs, we have the lines for each deploy. So we should have seen the graph change when that first one went out. Even if we didn't see it when it happened, even when we catch it hours later, we go look at the graphs and say, well, here's where it changed. What was in that push? And that push we see. Well, what was kind this? of graphs are these? Are these graphs of performance? Or are you noticing that all of a sudden it's messing up credit card numbers? You know, it could be anything. We have graphs for it. <laughs> I mean, I'm not kidding, we graph how much coffee is in the coffee machine. <laughs> so there will be a graph that changed for every single push. You know, you need, you need the human element to decide if it was a meaningful change or if it needs to be fixed. As for security, it's everyone's job. Just like performance is everyone's job. That said, we do have a specific team for fraud uh, that <coughs> kind of goes over, we're a retail site. Ah, yeah. Fraud is something that we can we contend with. Um, but everyone cares about security and performance. You know, like we were talking about before, when we used to throw over a lot of ops, and they'd be like, this doesn't run fast enough, so roll it back. It's now no longer like that. It's now the developer is going to say, this might be a problem. Let me turn it up to 1%, see what the graphs do, see if I can roll it up even further. And you get a good what kind of graphs do you graph, the graph seriously, not, not about the coffee? What kind of things do you really try to graph? So, so this is. This is literally just a small section of it. Showcase is one of our products where a seller can buy a spot to say, showcase this item of mine. And this is how many people are buying those. So as soon as that drops, we know that we broke something in Showcase. Uh, forum host to help. Anytime that goes up, we know there's a problem. We go look at what people are saying, and then we go find what area of code that is. We find a graph, we fix it. This one looks like you almost uh, fixed, a, fixed something in the second deploy. This uh, one? The form, yeah. No, the, the lines are almost, oh, right there. No, 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 no. Oh, there. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, we were trying to find a graph. Actually, we had somebody, uh, an, an advisor of ours, come and work with us for two weeks, and they might have broken the site for a little while. <laughs> trying to find that graph, I'm going to have to put it in. That's a cool graph. You can see, you can see stuff just flatline and come right back up. So it's, it's, it's pretty cool to see the stuff. Um, have you guys tried to introduce problems that you know are going to be a shit show and then see how your graphs and your metrics actually react to that? Mm -hmm. To such a state that they're in fact not to go up and alert you to the proper extent um, so at least you know you're doing the right job? No, Instead that's of just sitting cool. there twiddling your thumbs and thinking I got an A plus today? We, we, have, we have a lot of little problems that come up and that we fix right away. So we know that the system works, but the idea of doing something really big and seeing what yells is awesome. <laughs> yeah, that's a great one. Basically, she's asking, do you mess with your users? Yeah, I like that a lot. That's pretty. Well, that said, no, no, we don't. I'm saying it. it's a great, it's a great idea. Um, that said, the, the change that broke last week was was a pretty big one, and we did see the graphs do exactly what we wanted them to do. But we didn't have red alerts go off, so as part of the postmortem, we're adding now use alerts for that specific thing. 
close suggestion to your presentation, it would be pretty cool to see like everything function normally and then like alert status and like the code that introduced it and like holy shit, business X works. Do. You know, like we saved the business X amount of dollars and we're awesome and great. That's a really good idea. <laughs> there you go. Awesome. All right, time for one more. Do you have to deal with what problems? I have fraud problems. I don't know how much we can say. Um, stuff that's publicly known is stuff like sock puppets, which is fake accounts. Uh, uh, resellers. Um, we, we don't allow reselling on site, so we'll have people come and make fake accounts and sell, you know, not call handbags. Um, so we'll also have a place to catch and end and that stuff quickly. We also have external teams audit our code um, fairly regularly just to, to catch and Okay, I think that's about it. Right. Time. After gathering is over at the House of Burden. Oh, Forrest is here. Why don't you tell her? <laughs>